linear vector spaces is what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. And in this particular topic, we have three subjects we're going to be looking at, inner products, linear operators, and the range. So those are the three topics we're going to be looking at. In terms of properties of vector spaces, inner products obviously important. Norms are related, closely related. And then here are some important operators on vector spaces. So first we're going to talk about the inner product. The inner product is uh, an, uh, the dot product is an example of an inner product. But the inner product is defined on any math object that in, is in a vector space. Okay, so that's the that's the difference. And so the the inner product is defined to be, and we use we often use these uh, angled brackets uh, to indicate an inner product. Some some authors use round brackets, but it's more common to use these angle brackets. So basically, an inner product takes two arguments, okay? So both from the same vector space, and it gives a scalar in the field, whatever field you're working with. So if the objects that you're looking at are complex, then the result will be a complex value. So it will be a scalar value. So regardless of what these functions are, the result will be a scalar value, okay? So that's the concept of an inner product. And we can take anything from any vector space and define an inner product this way. So an inner product is a generalization of multiplication. But it's, it's a little different in that when you multiply the two things together, you don't get something that's of the same form. You always get something that's a scalar. Okay, so that's, that's different. So the inner product is defined by four properties. So this is the definition of the inner product. Some authors will choose to use only three of these properties. That is, they'll combine these two properties. But this is a, this is a standard way of defining uh, the inner product. There are other ways. So the first definition is called symmetry or conjugate symmetry. That is, if I take the inner product and then I put, put them in the opposite order, these two are equal with the conjugation of this one. Now, if the quantities we're working with are real, that is, if the field is the set of reals, then it's just, then you get the inner product going both ways. That is, the conjugate is the function. So in that case, uh, you, can, you can take the inner product in either order and you get the same value. Okay. So again, we get a scalar when we're all done. In this case, this linearity property, we have a sum here, inner product with something else, that gives us, we, we get something like a distributive law here. Okay, so the inner product of x with z plus the inner product of y with z. If I take now x and I take the inner product with a scalar times y, it turns out I can write it this way, I can take the scalar out and get x times the inner product of x with y. If I want the the scalar in, I will, I will need the conjugate over here. Okay, so this is a defining property of the inner product. So the inner product is is like a function that takes two arguments and gives you a single output, two inputs gives you a single output, but they need to satisfy these properties. And it turns out that for any vector space, there are an infinite number of inner products. The last one is the positivity property, and that says that if you take the inner product of something with itself of anything in the vector space with itself, I will get something that's greater than or equal to zero, and I will only get zero, that is, I will get equal zero if and only if x itself is zero. So if x is zero, the inner product should be zero. If x is not zero, then this inner product should be positive. Okay, so this is the definition of an inner product. And um, we'll look at some examples on in the fourth lecture in this, or the fourth uh, presentation here. So with inner products, because of the linearity property, we can get the inner product version of FOIL, firsts, outers, inners, and lasts. So here's, um, here's the sum that I'm taking, an inner product of a sum and a sum. And when, I, when I'm all done, I get the four terms, the firsts, inners, outers, lasts, x and z, 
Okay, so we get, this is the inner product version of FOIL. We get the same kind of thing. That is, you have to multiply every term by every other term. So, we have that. Inner product orthogonality is an important quantity that we can now define based on an inner product. And so, basically, two vectors in a vector space. Remember, when we're talking about vectors in a vector space, we could be talking about nth order polynomials. We could be talking about uh, n dimensional vectors, or three dimensional vectors, or six dimensional vectors. But two vectors, x and y, are orthogonal if the inner product of those two vectors is zero. When you take the inner product, so these two guys may not be zero, might not be zero. But if their inner product is zero, then they're orthogonal. Okay? So you can think of orthogonality as a generalization of perpendicular. Okay? Perpendicular. So if you have two vectors that are perpendicular with respect to each other, when you take their inner product, you'll get zero. So based on this definition, then, there is a vector space version of the Pythagorean theorem, which says that if x and y are orthogonal, then their inner product is zero, and you can go through when you do the FOIL, these two guys are both zero, their inner products are zero, and so we end up with this quantity. So the inner product of the sum with itself gives you the sums of the inner products of the individual elements. The cross terms go away. So in, in the Pythagorean theorem, I have an x and a y, and I can think of them as vectors. And so if we do x plus y, x plus y is you put, you put the tail to the head, okay, and then you, the, the sum then is, is the vector that goes from this tail to that head. So that's x plus y. And the Pythagorean theorem says that that length squared is equal to this length squared plus this length squared. And so that's exactly what we have here. We have this quantity squared is equal to this, this quantity squared plus this quantity squared. So this is the, this is the uh, vector space version. Because remember, x and y are a member of a vector space, which could be uh, a, a function that's continuous in, in the uh, region between 0 and 1. So it's not like just regular. So this is an example of two-dimensional vectors. And we can illustrate it using two-dimensional vectors. This theorem is powerful in that it applies to many different other math objects besides just two-dimensional vectors. So that's where the power of all of this comes in. So this is, a, this is valuable. We can also define something called an inner product space, which is a linear vector space with an inner product defined on that space. So it's sometimes referred to as a pre-Hilbert space. But we can actually define a space that has this. And there are certain things that can be said about those spaces. Next, we're going to talk about the norm. The norm is a function, takes a single argument in a vector space, and gives a positive real value or non-negative real value. That's what R plus means, non-negative real value. Okay, so this is the math notation for what this is, this is doing. Take something in the vector space and it maps into that values that are non-negative. So uh, just like the inner product is defined by four properties, the norm is defined by four properties. First property is the norm of x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in the vector space. Second is the norm is equal to zero if and only if, that's what this double-sided arrow means, if and only if x is equal to zero. So what this means is if x is zero, the norm is zero. If the norm is zero, then x must be zero. So if you think of an n-dimensional vector, what this is saying is if x is zero, what what does the n-dimensional zero look like? It's a vector with all zeros. Okay. And so if the norm is zero, so remember this is a scalar value that's a function of x. If this norm is equal to zero, that means that all the elements of x must be zero. So we, get, we have it going both ways. This property says that if I take a scalar times x, that that's equal uh, times x and take the norm of that vector, I get 
the absolute value of x, or rather the modulus, the magnitude of alpha, times the norm of x. And this, this should hold for all complex values and all x in the vector space. Okay. And finally, for x and y in, this, in the vector space, the sum of the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. This is called the triangle inequality. And, um, and we'll see later why you get this inequality but, and why it's a triangle. But so the Pythagorean theorem is related to this, but notice the Pythagorean theorem says x plus y squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So this is it's it's this is not the Pythagorean theorem because we're talking about x plus y squared. And so it's a little bit different. But anyway, that's the norm. So the norm and inner product can be related. That is, every inner product can be used to form a norm. Okay, every inner. So you can get norms that are not formed from inner products. But if a norm is formed from an inner product, then it is called an induced norm of the inner product. Okay, so this is this is one way of defining a norm. You take the inner product of something with itself, square root. So if you notice the property, this property was one of the properties of, or actually these two properties were properties of the inner product. So um, so we actually, this, this uh, definition comes out. And you can go through and show this definition satisfies all four properties for a norm. So notice we have to take the square root here because otherwise this property will not hold. You'll get alpha squared here instead of just alpha. So, so but this is like the standard difference formula uh, or distance formula, the length of a vector in Euclidean space. We also have these this other formula, that is the inner product of x and y is equal to the norm of x times the norm of y times the cosine of the angle between the two. So we can, in, in terms of vectors that are um, in two dimensions, theta is, is obvious. Sim similarly, in, even in three dimensions, theta would be, ob would be apparent. Um, but again, this holds for elements in any vector space. So again, it could be some other form, like it could be, these could be polynomials. And the inner product, there's still an angle. You can think geometrically of an angle that, that is between those two vectors. So we know that if the angle is 90 degrees, then those two are orthogonal. So cosine of theta is zero at that point, and the two are orthogonal. So 90 degrees orthogonality. So again, this shows us that the, the orthogonality is a generalized form of perpendicular. So if you think about things being perpendicular, so if I have two vectors that are perpendicular to one another, right, or they're orthogonal to another, but, but the difference is if I, have, if I have a vector, I can have more than one other vector that's orthogonal to it. That is, I can have a vector that, you know, that I can have an infinite number of vectors that are orthogonal to that, that one vector. Okay, so that's why orthogonality is a generalization of the inner product. And then we have some inner product properties. Again, the Pythagorean theorem. If x and y are orthogonal, then the norm squared of x plus y is equal to the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared. So that's the Pythagorean theorem. We have the parallelogram law for any x, for any x and y. They don't have to be orthogonal. Any x and y if I take the norm of the sum squared plus the norm of the difference squared, I get two times x squared plus two times y squared. So this is this is true for any x and y. Also true for any x and y is if I take the, the norm of x plus y squared, I get the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared plus two times the real part of the real part of the inner product of x and y. So remember, the real part, the inner product of x and y has a has a so in, in general, the inner product could be complex. And so what you can actually go through and show is that this is actually uh, something similar to the cosine of theta, the cosine of theta. And, and um, so that's why it's called the law of cosines, even though cosine doesn't appear in here. So generally speaking, if you have a complex uh, quantity, it's going to have a real part and an imaginary part. So that quantity, the real part is going to be the projection onto the real plane, which is going to be the cosine of an angle 
and the imaginary part will be the sine of the, at that angle. So that, that's where the, this, this comes into play here. So we have these inner product properties, or actually those are norm properties too. And we can also talk about something called an orthogonal subspace. Okay, so two subspaces are orthogonal if every element in each is orthogonal to every element in the other. So if I have an X from, from one subspace and a Y from another subspace, their, their inner product must be zero for all X and for all Y. Okay, so their inner product must be zero. So this is, this, this is a very helpful uh, concept that you can have uh, orthogonal elements. And we're going to see later where orthogonality comes into play. But for now, um, we have this definition. The orthogonal complement is a subspace. It's an orthogonal subspace to M. And it is basically the maximum orthogonal subspace to M. So it satisfies this property. The direct sum of M and M perp, so that's where the perp comes from, it's not a perpetrator. Um, M direct sum with M perp is equal to the entire vector space. And the intersection of M with M perp is just the zero element. Remember, remember every subspace has zero as an element. So what this is saying is the only element in common is the zero element. Okay, And so this is actually necessary for this to be a subspace is that it has the zero element. So these are some properties of inner products and norms.